Thank you. Good morning. My name is Kevin Langmar, President and CEO of Titan Products. Delighted to be here uh, today to participate in our patient experience summit. Um, and, and Jim, I'd like to thank you for your comments, but an outstanding start uh, to the dialogue today. And uh, really, uh, I think it's probably difficult to follow up for everybody that they're going to this morning. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Mike Stockley. Mike is with the Healthcare Value Network. Thanks, Kevin. I appreciate that. That really was a great opening um, this morning. And I think I might have a little bit, how, how are we doing sound wise? Are we okay? I might have a little bit for the others in the crowd. So let me just get an understanding here. How many people here uh, are here because they're patients? So show them these. So we got a few patients at the patient experience summit. That's great. Good. Uh, so how many people are in the business of caring for patients? Uh, as uh, Dr. Manuel was talking about. Okay, a little bit more. We have patient. And so the rest of you, do you, what do you do? Do you make stuff for hospitals and doctors? And what do you do? Who else is here? I want to know. You make stuff? Do you distribute stuff? Okay, so I got people that make stuff. I got people that distribute stuff. I got people that use stuff to deliver to the patients, and then the patients get the stuff, and then get the experience. So I pretty much got everyone covered. That's great. Uh, so I think I'm gonna build a little bit on uh, what we heard this, with this morning's presentation and tell you a little bit about uh, what is the Theta Care Center for Healthcare Value. Is anybody familiar with Theta Care, the healthcare system in Wisconsin? So maybe I better explain a little bit about that. Okay, in Appleton, Wisconsin, there's an organization called Theta Care, and Dr. John Toussaint uh, was the CEO at ThetaCare. Um, he's now retired from that uh, post, but uh, that's what, when I met him, when I was with ASQ, he was the CEO at ThetaCare. And uh, we were working on a way to figure out this data transparency question. Is there a way that perhaps the American Society for Quality could be the repository of this comparative data? And um, it didn't work out. Uh, we couldn't f find a, that as the house to hold the comparative data. We did find a house. And so I kept in touch with what he was doing. And then I reconnected with him a couple years ago. But here's what he was doing. He was learning about the principles of lean improvement uh, and how they applied to healthcare because they had tried everything else. They had tried what was called continuous process improvement. 
Um, some people called it TQM, although Dr. Deming would not allow anybody to say the word TQM in his four-day seminars. Uh, he, that was not associated with what he was doing. Uh, so they tried everything. And from a local snow uh, blower manufacturer in uh, Appleton, Wisconsin, named Aaron's, they learned about making snow blowers. And they learned that these principles of looking at systems, focusing on the customer, and really studying and improving processes that had been around for years and years and years. Actually, Dr. Deming taught the Japanese in the, in the 40s and 50s. And then companies like Toyota built on this and designed systems like the Toyota production system. There's a Honda production system. There's many of these production systems. So he said, wow, this is great. These people take better care of their snowblowers than we do of our patients. And there's a lot to learn here. So really got serious about the application of lean and theta care around 2002, 2003. Now there was a few other healthcare organizations in the United States and Canada that were doing this as well. You probably heard of Virginia Mason, uh, Denver Health is often mentioned, and there's a bit of a debate on the West Coast whether was it first Virginia Mason or was it Seattle Children's or some of the others. Things were going on up there in, uh, in near the Seattle area. Bottom line is more and more healthcare organizations were starting to apply this lean work and ThetaCare had great results. So when Dr. Toussaint retired as the CEO, he started something new. He's always instigating something new. And he said, we need to get more healthcare organizations applying these concepts because the prevailing style of management is just not going to work. Dr. Deming was very clear on this, that our problem is the prevailing style of management. Uh, it's a mythology, the way that we've been trained and, and educated simply does not work and we need to face up to that. And so they were learning about what is a better style of management that needs to be adopted. And more healthcare organizations needed to learn about this. So uh, the first goal was to establish the Theta Care Center, which is a separate 501c3 organization, which is established in 2008. And in 2009, they convened organizations, healthcare organizations from around the world, really, in Boston, between the Lean Enterprise Institute and the Theta Care Center, brought together these healthcare organizations from um, around the world, uh, 50 representatives, to talk about, um, so you're looking at lean, you're thinking about lean, what help do you need to make this work? And they said, well, it's pretty lonely out here. I mean, we try, we're trying to do this, we're trying to figure it out, we can find people to help us, but it's pretty lonely. And most people think we're crazy when we talk about, you know, really fundamentally thinking about this and we get all sorts of debate about, well, we're not in the car manufacturing business, we take care of patients and yada, 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 all this stuff. And so they said what we'd really like is a way to connect with each other. We don't even know who each other is. So that was the impetus of what became known as the Healthcare Value Network. Started with 14 organizations from North America that said, let's just get together and agree to go share what each other is doing. Let's learn from each other, share with each other, let's continue to learn from industry, and let's share with each other. So our first goal is to get more healthcare organizations thinking about fundamental redesign of the systems and what do they need to do to do that. So that's a big part of the, um, the healthcare value network. But that's not going to be enough because you can improve your systems and improve your processes. You can take the waste out of the system, but under the prevailing current uh, form of reimbursement that Jim was talking about, you go out of business because of the way that reimbursement is currently designed paying on volume as opposed to paying on value. And especially as you reduce the waste and expenses in a DRG-based system, uh, the CFOs are going to get irritated at, what are you guys doing? I mean, you're hampering, you're, you're ruining the bottom line. And a lot of healthcare organizations have experienced this. I've talked to Intermountain Healthcare, they experienced it years ago. Virginia Mason experienced it. ThetaCare experienced it. Many of our healthcare value network organizations are experiencing this. So we're going to have to work on changing the payment system. We're going to have to redesign the payment system, and we're going to have to help that to happen. And then finally, and this builds uh, into the transparency uh, um, discussion that was uh, prompted at the previous presentation. So if we can redesign care, get the waste out of the system, post focus on value for the patients, if our payment systems are aligned so that we're rewarded for providing value, not volume, the third needs to be get the data in the hands of the consumer, like you and I, 
so that we know where we're going to go to get our care. And I don't mean something on a website that's six months old. I mean, I want to, if I'm going in for surgery tomorrow, I want to know what's the infection rate at that hospital now. What's the cost now? I want to, and we're making it available. So, in the course of my presentation, I may be talking a little bit about some of the resources that were put together. The story of the Thetacare story is in a book called On the Mend, and it's at createvalue.org, and there's a slide on createvalue.org a little bit later. The story about this three-part strategy about all these things is in another book called Potent Medicine, and so both of these are written by Dr. Toussaint, and they're available, and it really contains some of the detail behind some of the things I'm going to be talking about. So, again, this is the beginning of some conversation and some learning. So let's talk a little bit about the patient experience. As we heard earlier, everyone here will be a patient. Everyone will have somebody in their family who is a patient. So what's going on with the patient experience? What is it about? Well, we know that the patient experience might be that our systems are going to kill you. In 1999, 2000, there were two great books that were written, Institute of Medicine, the first was called um, uh, To Err is Human, and uh, then The Quality Chasm. And they showed through data that on average it seemed that the healthcare system, through its best efforts, prevailing style of management, was killing roughly 100,000 people per year. This was not, these were not people that came in and were going to die. These were people that came in expecting one thing and then we did something to them, not because we're bad people, but because our systems. So think in terms of this, a theme for my presentation is going to be, think about the systems. The systems actually kill people, and it hasn't improved that much. A recent study, 2008, showed that what happened based upon what was discussed in, in those years earlier, not much progress has been made in terms of, of that. That's a scary situation. So the, one of the patient's experience is going to be is, um, we may kill you. Another patient experience is, is, if we don't kill you, we may harm you. We may do things to you that, again, you didn't expect. It could be an infection. It could be something left in, to, in the surgery. It could be you were supposed to give this, give this medication, and you got that medication, something happened. Um, now let me pause a little bit here. How many people in this audience know of somebody that they think might have been either uh, affected by either of these two categories? Show of hands. Oh my God, just look around. Just keep your hands up for a minute. Look around. People, this is happening. So this is not something that's theoretically happening. This is happening. What else is going on with the patient experience? Well, as we heard before, and you're, real, you're recognizing this as well, it's costing people. It used to be that there was uh, insurance companies and third-party payers that they absorbed all of this and we didn't really recognize that and now more and more of it is, uh, holy cow, uh, is this going to deplete my savings? Uh, will I have any money left? Uh, another experience, uh, the patient experience is, is it's like the show Lost where you get into the system and you don't know which way to turn, you don't know which way to go. You don't know where to go to navigate. So those are the patient experience. This slide comes courtesy of Jim Womack, a former CEO of the Lean Enterprise Institute, uh, still a senior advisor there. And he showed our annual summary. He's uh, one of these observers of, of things, of businesses, including healthcare. And he just made this simple slide that said part of the problem is is the, the prevailing way that we're managed, and I don't think healthcare is unique with this, is uh, we manage in silos. So we think in terms of here's the lab, here's the nursing unit, here's the x-ray, here's the doctors, and we even do this when we teach um, uh, clinicians. So we have internal medicine, we have family practice, we have surgery, and then we have subcategories of all these. And so we think in terms of these verticals. and there may or may not be some horizontals behind there. Um, so, but part of the problem is we expect the, the patients to make sense, and this is where people get lost, people get hurt, people get killed, and it's very expensive to try to figure out how do we hop across these verticals that are occurring here. And so, what is the patient experience like? So at ThetaCare, 
one of the, um, the efforts was to figure out, um, so what's going on with the care of the pa cancer patient? And what is their experience like? And so this is uh, from some of their work. They said, well, what happens? Well, people go through a screening process, and then they have questions here, and they've got to go through a di diagnosis here. There's a dead end over here. They come back here, and then there's another diagnosis here. They go wrong way. There's a lot of detours. They come back here, the treatment, a lot of times they end up going, pat, going back here to restart. Uh, and then eventually something may happen along the way. All of those things that I mentioned previously, it's gonna be costly. It may hurt you, it might kill you. And, and uh, that's the patient experience. And so they had to figure this out. They had to really stop and say, what are we going to do to affect, because this is the patient experience. This is what we're doing. This is what we need to do. Now, I'm going to switch gears a little bit here, and I may be emphasizing something for some of the people that perhaps are on the business of either making stuff or uh, distributing stuff. There's a little bit of something here for everyone. So that's me and my brother Dave. I'm the oldest of eight kids. Uh, and Dave, uh, that picture was taken about two years ago. I visited him at his house in California. And uh, Dave, uh, about Nine months after this was taken, I was in, he was in top health, uh, he was diagnosed with acute lymphocytic leukemia. And so things changed for Dave. This is Dave right now. Um, he's in a wheelchair. Well, why is he in a wheelchair? Well, when you're uh, a patient with leukemia, one of the treatments is chemotherapy. And some of the chemotherapy regimens are very caustic. And so what happened in this situation is uh, it was uh, affecting his spinal cord and so now he's he, he can move his legs but he can't support his weight so he's confined to a wheelchair so this is his daughter Paige and this is his wife Carol and so um, sometimes you know you hit a triple and then sometimes you just wake up on third base in other words sometimes you get lucky I'm not saying Dave's lucky but I'm saying you're lucky because I was visiting Dave last week and happened to be in California and hearing the stories from Carol about her experience of trying to help navigate this situation. And I told her what I was going to be doing next week. She said, wow, that's really interesting. I just wrote a five-page letter to um, a, uh, a president of a medical supply company because of my frustration. And I said, can I see that? So she printed it off and showed it to me, and I go, wow, can I share this? She said, well, please change the name. Don't really tell people who this is. But I said, I think this story needs to be told. And so what I'm going to do is let's pretend Dave and Carol are right here. They're part of the patient. This is a patient experience summit. And let's learn a little bit more about what is this patient experience from the standpoint of not entirely the people that are at the sharp end of care, but upstream, the systems that are upstream, many of those verticals that are upstream. So I had to change the, the name here, so I came up with some names. So this was written on September 7th, that's an important date. Okay, Fred Flintstone, president, had to come up with some name, XYZ Medical Supplies, Anywhere USA, this could happen anywhere. Dear Mr. Flintstone, I'm writing to you today because a friend of mine who is the leader of all the nurses in a large hospital told me that you would want to know about my unfortunate situation with your company. She convinced me that with you as the leaders of the company would not want any customer, patient, or human being coming to your company for needed medical supplies to be put through my experience. If I don't tell you about this, you will never know what really happens with the systems that you have put in place. I'm counting on the fact that you are good people and my friend is correct, okay? So on July 2nd of this year, so the letter was written in September, but what she's talking about happened in July. My husband was in elsewhere hospital in need of catheter supplies. He was sent home with several sterile self-cath kits, the same kind he's been taught to use in the hospital, with the same kind his doctor prescribed for him. He was assured his prescription was processed through the home health agency would be overseeing his care at home. He would have his needed supplies in a couple days. Makes perfect sense, right? Kathy himself was a new and for my husband. He's been fighting for his life 
against leukemia for the last 20 months. And during three intense rounds of chemo, stem cell transplant, and almost a year of recovery before being slammed with a relapse to the brain and subsequent treat treatments directly into the brain resulting in the most unfortunate and rare situation of spinal cord damage. So that's the whole thing that transpired that I was explaining earlier. Now he has no use of his legs, as well as no sensation or control of bladder or bowels. As you can imagine, if you'd be willing to put yourself in the shoes of your customer patients, this was devastating for him, a strong, independent, accomplished man who had done amazing things with his life. So when we saw that video earlier, and we were looking at all those people, and what they were thinking, what they were going through, this is some of the real world. I'm sure you would agree that no additional trauma was needed or warranted for a person in this circumstance, nor their family. Yet that is exactly what we experienced from your company. In the midst of the first day home from the hospital with a very high learning curve of a patient for my husband on July 3rd, I found myself on the phone with Betty, I had to come up with a name, came with Fred Flintstone, an employee with your company in the role of assisting customers. It was unbelievable to me that I was begging and pleading with her to help us get the supplies we needed after being told that there was additional necessary paperwork because of the holiday weekend, we probably wouldn't receive our order for another six I begged her, telling her that she knows more than anyone about this. What should I do? Please tell me what to do. Please, this is Carol speaking here. Please, please tell me what to do. Please at least help us get emergency supplies, I begged. Apparently she wasn't trying how to do that, or your company really doesn't do that. I don't know which is the case, but either one is inexcusable. She was still unwilling or unable to help, even after I said, Betty, if you can't help us, then tomorrow, while you're at the 4th of July celebration, barbecue with your family, my husband and I are going to be in the emergency room. You are leaving us with no choice because he must cath every five hours. I still can't believe this is okay with her. I still can't believe it's okay with your company. I still can't believe we were put in this situation and that Betty wasn't trained or able to help us. She was getting off work in a few minutes, looking forward to her holiday weekend, and there was nothing she could do. Unbelievable. So on that day, Carol says, I experienced some of the worst of the system by your company, but also on that day I experienced some of the best in the kindness of individual people and the graciousness of another medical supply company who was willing to provide us with emergency supplies. A company who wasn't even going to see a profit from us was willing to deliver the necessary medical supplies to our doorstep. Within three hours of my conversation on the phone, Betty, from your company, who was willing to do nothing. What does that say about your company? Has anybody ever received a letter like this from a, a, an irate customer? Some nods in the head. Yeah, this is real. This really happens. What does that say about your company? How do you think that makes me feel toward your company and the work there? Maybe you don't know. I don't know. Also within an hour of my conversation with Betty and a refusal or inability to help. Again, I think she's trying to empathize with Betty, saying maybe, maybe the company didn't train her. Try not to blame Betty. I received a phone call from a paraplegic man who works in a hospital who found out about our dire circumstances through the Home Health Agency, so Good Samaritans coming to help, who was also doing everything they could do to help us. This man was willing to give us many cathing kits as we needed to get us through the emergency from his own personal supply. Now, from what I could tell, Betty's a very nice young girl, but because of the company she works for, my very ill husband and I were put through a needless and traumatizing and stressful situation. Why were others help and you weren't? You wouldn't you would think that ends my unfortunate experience with your company, but it does not. After waiting hours through the weekend and using the emergency supplies provided by another company, by Monday, almost a week after discharge, I hadn't heard from anyone from the company. After several unsuccessful phone calls to your company during the day, being put on hold and not help, once again I found myself on hold with intermittent recording telling me not to hang up because I'll lose my place in line. I waited on cold for an hour and 15 minutes before finally hanging up in defeat. During that time, the nurse from the home health agency even called your company, I guess on a privileged line or something. Someone answered her call 
as she was also trying to push our order through, and she was told that I was waiting on hold for an hour. Still, I received no help. No one answered my call. So by Tuesday, one full week after being home from the hospital, we still did not have our needed cathing supplies because no help of receiving them anytime soon. We were running out of emergency supplies, the one that were provided by another company. An hour on the phone with, on hold with your company, and of course, every time I called, I got a different person who didn't know anything. It's like those 60 nurses that we saw, you know, all those people, they didn't know. They weren't talking to each other. The doctor's office had faxed the necessary paperwork and also was trying to help us by calling your company. So here's the doctor doing workarounds, trying to help, trying to make up for what the system's not doing. The home, agency, home health agency had called several times. The insurance company assured me that the order was approved and they didn't know why you weren't sending it out. I think my case manager from the insurance company also called your company. In addition to calling your company, I was now being forced to call the doctor's office, the home health agency, the insurance company several times because your company was telling me that all those people hadn't done what they were supposed to do. You see what's going on here? The verticals are starting to point fingers at each other, or at least this vertical is pointing fingers at the other ones. They had. They had. At one point, I had to give the doctor's office Wilma's direct number. So we got a new person involved now. Carol introduced Wilma. Wilma we'll find out later who Wilma is and gave Wilma the doctor's office number. I had to tell Wilma to call the gal at the doctor's office right now. She will answer and tell you that she already faxed your paperwork. That's how ridiculous this has become that I had to do your company, to, had, that's how ridiculous this became and what I had to do with your company to get our medical supplies. Don't forget, I had a very weak sick husband in a hospital bed at home that was also trying to take care of while I was spending all this ridiculous time trying to get cathing supplies, and these are not optional. You just can't decide not to cath yourself. This was now to the point of ridiculous, and I would even say it was the point of customer-patient abuse. Again, the patient experience. What are we doing to our patients? This is going nowhere. All my efforts aren't accomplishing anything. I'm getting a complete runaround with your company, blaming the hospital, blaming the home agency, blaming the doctor, blaming the employees of the doctor's office. I called once and requested to speak to a supervisor. I connected with Wilma. Now we find out who Wilma is. I informed her of my, or my dire need for the cathing supplies. I begged her to look into what was happening and call me back. I begged her to explore why I was put on hold for at least an hour and 15 minutes. Call me back. Wilma assured me she would look into the situation and call me back. And this is all in caps here so that the president can see this. I have now waited two months and I have received no call back. Unbelievable. So that's why it transpired in July and we're just getting the letter in, in September. Okay. She informed me it was three minutes. I laughed. While we were on the phone, she actually received the report from the previous day and she told me that the average hold time for the day was two minutes and something. Let me remind you, she was referring to the same day I waited for an hour and 15 minutes, hanging up in defeat, repeat, in defeat. And it's all from the back, but it does way, it was probably because it was later in the day on the East Coast. There aren't any many employees working. The company's aware. That's appalling to me. I told her how wrong this is. If you know that West Coast customers slash patients slash doctors aren't being adequately serviced during those hours, if you stayed on your phone answering machine and website that you're open during those hours, if you want to be a company that services the entire U.S., then why would you number of employees during those hours? It's very simple. Wilma said the budget doesn't allow for that. Wilma said the budget doesn't allow for that. Talk about the prevailing style of management, right? What? That's crazy. I think it's safe to say that those employees answer the phone are not highly paid employees. Uh, you are, as president of the company, you are. The people to whom I am writing this letter are. The people who have the power to make the adequate changes are to change those systems. I know that the medical supply executives and salespeople make very good incomes. I know the medical supplies company make a lot of money. So Carol knows it, 
and other people know it too. I cannot accept the fact that the company simply can't afford to hire enough employees to adequately service West Coast customers and patients and that hold times of over an hour are acceptable to you. This is ridiculous. Did I tell you that my hour and 15 minute hold was after I had already had several times passed around by several employees and immediately told I was transferred to the wrong person, blah, blah, blah. Right before I was transferred the last time, I waited over an hour listening to the intermittent recording telling me not to hang up because I'll lose my, line, my place in line. I specifically asked the employee who was putting me on hold whether I was going to wait a long time if I'd already waited a long time between other transfers. She said, oh no, the, the department I'm transferring you to doesn't usually have a long hold time. Wrong. And let me remind you, this is happening during the first week being home from the hospital. A patient who is fighting for his life against leukemia for almost two years, recently been stricken with spinal cord injury from his chemo, resulting in the loss of his legs, no control of bladder valves, he was in terrible pain, so weak he couldn't even sit on the edge of the bed or adjust his body unassisted. He required 24-hour care. And I was on a very steep learning curve. I did not have the emotional capacity, physical energy, or time to be battling for hours with your company to get the necessary supplies for caffeine that had been prescribed by his attending doctor that he had been trained to use in the hospital and the home health agency had ordered and had been approved by his insurance company. I felt at the time, I still feel today, that your, what your company put me through was abusive. She used the word abusive. Please, for just one moment, put, put yourself in our shoes. That was in the video early, earlier. Put yourself in their shoes. My husband and me and asked what kind of service you would need from a medical supplier. Please remember, caffeine is not optional. It's not something you can put off because it's inconvenient or don't have supplies. If you don't have supplies to, ca to cath, it becomes a medical emergency in a matter of six hours. Those are your customers. Those are the people on the other end of, your, of the phone. How did that get lost in your systems? Did I tell you that I told Wilma all these things? Did I tell you I begged her to look into what happened to me and call me back? Did I tell you Wilma assured me she would look into it? and call me back? Did I tell you that was two months ago? Did I tell you I still haven't heard from her? Can you imagine how that makes me feel about her and your company? I would venture to say that if you and your family suffered a similar situation by any company, you would even be more livid than I. You would even be more angry because I know how wrong it is, because it's the business you're in. Let me tell you something about Carol. She's one of the sweetest, nicest people I ever met, but this whole experience has turned, turned her in quite a, quite a tomcat. I mean, she's, she's, she's sticking up for the family here. She says, I'm only one person, but please let my experience remind you that your business isn't about paperwork, phone calls, and medical supplies of all sorts. Your business is about people, people in desperate circumstances, circumstances you would never want to be in, circumstances you wouldn't wish on your worst enemy, circumstances that are actually could happen to anyone at any time, anybody in this room, this could happen. No one expects it, no one ever wants it, everyone is vulnerable. Why would you want to make our terrible circumstances even more horrible and traumatic with your systems, policies and inadequacies. Adequacies. Then she pauses. She says, I know there's a lot in this letter for you to wade through. Imagine living through it. Imagine being put through all this on some of the worst days of your life. That's what the systems in place at your company did to me and my husband. I know this is a very long letter. I beg you to respect the amount of time it took to write it and thoroughly read it with compassion. I would appreciate a response. Thank you, Carol. You know, when I got this letter, I was thinking, gee, should I read it to the whole group? I mean, what are people going to think? What do you think? I mean, I had to represent the patient experience, right? And it is the patient experience. And those are real people. Let me ask this question. I wasn't planning on doing this, but if you were the president of the company and you got this letter, what would you do? What would you do? You would, you would what? Call her. Okay. You would call her. What else would you do? You'd go what? Go actually go see them. Okay. Put the face to face. What else would you do?
you start looking at the systems, maybe? I think, I think some of this occurred. Unfortunately, again, I go back to the prevailing style of management, and what Carol told me was, is she's, she was called, she was, you know, got, got the connection, and, and she, you know, in the short term felt better about that. But she also heard that Wilma uh, was now on medical leave because this affected Wilma badly. And it would be my contention that the worst thing that management could do was go to Wilma or Betty and anyone and start asking them, so why did you do this? It goes back to the systems. Management allowed these systems to be in place. Management reinforced them. Management um, rewarded people for doing certain things, for staying within budget, right? So that's another unfortunate outcome of this situation. So under the prevailing style of management, top management says, well, bring Betty in here. Let's get Wilma in here. Let's have a th talking to them. They shouldn't have done this. Well, guess what? It wasn't Betty. It wasn't Wilma. It was Fred and his systems that he allowed to take place. And that's unacceptable. So thanks for letting me share that. There's another story, and you can get this online, when Dr. Toussaint at the last um, annual quality summit that we held in uh, June of this past year, he told his story. So I told my story, he told his story. He kept the, um, the um, um, name of the person, well, he talked about Tish, but he related a story about a, a, a woman in Florida who has been uh, taken through this horrendous situation as far as healthcare that lasted three weeks. All these different things occurred, five different healthcare facilities, rehospitalized for an infection. Remember the things that happened to you? the things we do, multiple med rec errors, medical rec medic medication reconciliation, the meds I need, the ones I have, are they the same, do they make sense, patient safety protocols were ignored, lab specimens were lost, they waited for hours, her express wishes were ignored, she had more than 20 s needle sticks, John Toussaint does a better job explaining this than I, that's his mother-in-law, he told the story of his own person, of his own mother-in-law, and he wanted to tell the name of the hospital system that she was dealing with, and she begged him, please don't tell which system it was. But it could be any system. That was my point with Carol's letter. It could be any It could be your company that's doing this. So what are we going to do? Well, I think work needs to be done across these verticals, whether it's inside a company, like a hospital, or between companies, such as those that are assembled here today. Work needs to be done to get the collaboration. So this is what Jim Womack said, um, healthcare providers must learn to think horizontally. We were not trained to think horizontally. We weren't rewarded and recognized for thinking horizontally. We were rewarded and recognized for doing the best we could with our part, with our vertical, to keep our part within budget, to keep our productivity where it was. We were not trained and educated to think across these verticals. And we need to act horizontally, which means a whole new level of collaboration and, and cooperation. And so this is, I showed you the previous slide as far as the problem of the oncology patient and all the things that are occurring. And so Theta Care has been about trying to make this horizontal care of the oncology patient work better. And the interesting, one of the interesting things is here, you see the color coding here, you see who owns what Theta Care owns where they can directly manage a lot of this has to be done through collaboration efforts between organizations they don't own. And they have to work with other people and say, okay, here's our part of the process. How does that connect with your part of the process? And how are we gonna work together for the betterment of the patient? We just aren't designed to do that way. We don't trust each other. We're, we, don't, we didn't grow up collaborating. It didn't work. So, I'm getting ready to close here. So I wanna tell you a little bit more about the Healthcare Value Network. We heard from Cleveland Clinic. Cleveland Clinic is one member of the Healthcare Value Network. We have a lot of members of the Healthcare Value Network. Currently, we have 58 healthcare organizations, and it's in that upper left hand, right hand circle that I showed earlier. These are the organizations that are learning, sharing, connecting with each other around the application of these principles. Now, do they have it all perfect? No. Are they working on it? Yeah. Are they collaborating? You bet. Are they trying to make things better? Every day. And it's my job to help them to learn, share, and connect with each other. When I connected with John Toussaint back in 2000, when did I start? Okay, about 2000, 
11, reconnected with him. And um, I said, I hear you're up to something. I may be interested in participating in that. What's, the, what's, what's this all about? And he says, I want to work with the top 1%. He didn't mean the top 1% in terms of who has the best numbers. He meant the ones that really, really get it. Those that understand that the prevailing style of management won't work, never has worked, needs to be thrown overboard, and we need to totally learn new things. We all went to the wrong school. Every, no matter what university you went to, it was the wrong school because they taught you things that perhaps aren't true, definitely aren't true, and there's no school that we know of in a deliberate way that's teaching what needs to be done. Our companies need to become universities, and these are becoming universities, and they're collaborating with each other. And here's our distribution around the United States and Canada, so we're, we're well represented there. And I want to say a bit about sponsor members. So you think in terms of that vertical, it's not just the people that are in the caregiving business that are part of this gang tackle, as John calls it, the gang tackle of healthcare, because this is huge. We're trying to do three, three things. Redesign healthcare using new management philosophies that most people aren't aware of and never learn. We need to change the payment systems. And you saw what's, what's happening in recently with trying to help in that payment adjustment. And we're also trying to make data more transparent. This is a huge gang tackle and we need everyone. So we partner with uh, representatives that are also part of a larger uh, value chain. Uh, Cardinal Health, we have representation from here today. Uh, Simpler is a consulting company that helps uh, organizations learn about lean and lean thinking. HGA is an architectural firm, and in, the, in terms of design of space and redesign, before you build inefficiencies into new hospitals and new clinics, what if you think about the space that you need and then design it better? And then Underwriter Laboratories is uh, one of our newer um, sponsor members. Sponsor members uh, participate in the learning act activities that we have. Um, they also help um, in terms of offsetting the cost for the member organizations. Um, so we're interested in other organizations that are interested in, in being a part of this gang tackle. Fortunately, we um, know Kevin uh, and his team in, um, in, in the Appleton area, and we've uh, engaged in conversations with them, and they're very interested in, in being added to this list. And we're going to need every, the, the help of everyone because we have to redesign these systems and processes that just didn't work for Carol and Dave and they didn't work for Tish, and they're not gonna work for you when you need healthcare either. So here's what you can do. You can learn more. I referenced those books earlier. Go to createvalue.org. Got a website there, has a lot of stuff. I encourage you to collaborate with providers on improvement. So if you're not in the business of care, but you give stuff or make stuff for the people that are in the business of care, collaborate with them and help them to make those systems work as best as they can and make your systems work as best as they can um, up, up and down that horizontal. Um, and we need everyone to participate in the gang tackle that we talked about. I think I'm done. What questions do you have? Are there questions? Comments? Debate? Yes? Other than giving Wilma a, um, a, me a medical leave? No, no, I don't think they have a clue. I really don't think they have a clue. I don't, need, I don't think they know where to start. When Carol was talking about systems, I don't think that person knew what they meant. And Carol and I have not talked about lean and lean thinking, but she's understanding systems and she knows what's not working here. And she was very careful not to blame the people. But I'm, I'm thinking that, that that company is going along, you know, as it has with its budgets and its call reports and things like that. I don't know. I don't know. But it could be any company. So to that question, yeah, she got a response. Did they change their systems? I hope so. Yes. I guess I could contact them and say, you may know my sister-in-law, Carol. Um, you may be interested in who I am and what I do. I'd be happy to come in and help you study these systems to see if we can make them better. And then I would know a little bit whether it's a special cause, as Dr. Deming said, some rare occurrence that only occurs on, on, the, on the weekend before um, uh, 4th of July, 
or if this is currently going right now on October 29th, if that company is doing this to other people, I don't know. I don't know. I could do that, I suppose. I could call them. I, I have got their name. It's not really Fred, Fred Flintstone. There really is a person behind that. There was another question here, yeah. If you, if you think about automotive being at the, with the high end of maturity for lean thinking, maybe at a nine or a mm -hmm. ten, where would you put healthcare? Kindergarten. And, and healthcare admits it. Um, yeah, the question was so automotive and other industries have been out this for years and years and years. I mean, Toyota designed this for the sake of survival in the 1960s, and that machine has been and going on for decades. And automotive, automotive industry got the, the religion a large part in 1980 with a white paper that uh, uh, documented, featured Dr. Deming, if the Japan can, why can't we? So, there's a, there's a steep learning curve. Some don't even know they need to go to school. Some think that they can just get it with uh, better computers uh, if we just hardwire things, if we just got the right people. Uh, so yeah, uh, healthcare's uh, in kindergarten, uh, but they're improving. Next year maybe they'll be in first grade with the help of the other industries because those other industries are the ones that are going to be the, the recipient, recipients of the healthcare that they deliver. Are there other questions? Yes, yes. Several times you mentioned the prevailing style of management. Right, the prevailing style of management. Yes, the root cause of the problem. Right. So, what are the main changes? What are the top sure. areas? Sure. All right. <clears throat> Just a quick overview. So, the prevailing style of management, as Dr. Deming described, if you read his 1986 book, out of the crisis. He's got a very nice section there he talks about where what are all the typical answers that management comes up with to get themselves out of difficulty. And it's things like establish a quality office. Nowadays it's establish a lean office. Um, hire um, somebody to, or a new company for a computer. Hold everyone accountable. Um, and, and there's a whole list of things that are, that are incorrect in the prevailing style of management. If you read his 1993 book, he describes it even more detail where he says on the left hand side we've got skills only required. So anybody could essentially manage a company if they just followed these things like management by objectives. They divide the organization up and manage it and try to manage it by part. We treat our organizations as if they were bowling teams where we said here's nursing, here's laboratory, here's x-ray, here's pharmacy, and you're productive, and you're productive, and you're productive, we're gonna hold you to your individual productivity, and then we're gonna add it all up, just like a bowling team where you add up the scores, and we think that equals a productive organization. What do you think about that? If my productivity is gonna be affected by helping you, do you think I'm gonna help you? You think that's gonna work to make the verticals or the horizontals appear? It's going to make me stay with my vertical. So the prevailing style of management does not think of the organization of a system. It thinks of it as a collection of parts. It doesn't understand variation. So when things occur, they go take action. And they take action on people. They blame people, like Wilma. Um, they, they don't understand um, that they need to have constancy of purpose. They don't understand what business they're in. They don't understand they need to focus on the customer. And so they've been led to believe that if they get their MBA degree and learn to quantify with precision the detail, the differences between this department and that department, do some benchmarking and see what the best you know, ABC department is and hold them accountable for their, those numbers, and they think that's but it's just simply not. It doesn't nurture collaboration. It causes people to not take joy in work. Nobody likes working in a company like that, and they wonder, why people leave the companies. So there's a lot there under that prevailing style of management. And I think we're not now just realizing it because up until now, things have gone pretty good. The problems weren't evident now, but now the problems are becoming more evident. And we have to look backward and say, we see the problem, the problem's us. And we need to unlearn things that we thought were true and learn some new things that have been around for centuries and decades. It's all there for our use. If we would just say, you know what, I need to learn something new. And some people thought they stopped learning at age 20 or 22 and then they started doing their job. Not the case at all. Everybody in this room needs to learn new things every day. We doing okay on time? Good. Did that answer your question? I just gave you two more books to read, so. <laughs> if you haven't already read it. 
Okay, looks like that's it. I've, I've worn my welcome out. It was that five-page letter, wasn't it? Okay, thank you, folks.